it already. So that means as we go proceed, we'll have many, many more varieties to come. And they have, stand, they have stood apart in many countries' trials. Many countries' trials, they stood apart and they did very well. Can you go down? And You have to close it and open a new file. Close that file and open it again fresh. Because the acknowledgments are there, that's the main thing. <laughs> so, uh, just, just try it. Can, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Yeah, so, so uh, what I will uh, uh, I'll be doing is uh, the what were the thirty varieties that came uh, uh, so far, but the the scope is so enormous, and so big. It's only time alone will tell you that what we are heading for. And not only this, this will now spread to other crops even barley, wheat, uh, soybean. Many crops they are copying this now as a model. And can we do the same thing in other crops? And this is already picking up in other crops too. So therefore, uh, this opens the strength of the uh, the breeding becomes more powerful when you put the tools of genomic tools like 3K genomic tools, and this along with the donor gene pool you know and the recipient pool you know the whole genome sequence, and you can play with them with the help of uh, the uh, the the data that you are going to explore with whole genome sequencing information. You know what you are talking exactly. Even those multiple stresses, multiple complex stories, who cares to understand why? How many genes they interplay, why you want to know about it first in the first place? Even if you isolate a hundred of them, so what? Can you create that variety again? That's the question. The breeders can do that. No GM or no other guy can recreate that kind of thing. Because a breeder can really recreate that whole thing. And this, with these tools can make that possible. Because in a GM approach, or, uh, when you compare with the GM approach, you are going to pick one or two genes and then you put it them and then say, I will make a big story out of it. But that story is only one single event. With that money, I could make thousands of varieties in a pipeline like ever, nobody can stop that. So that kind of power is with what we are emerging with this kind of tool. Okay? So this is a very good uh, strategy and uh, possibly we'll see uh, with the genomic tools uh, uh, we can also think about other methods like double haploid breeding and other technologies that are also emerging can we go still faster can we reduce that cycle from four below that can we go below that that's the challenge uh, I would say uh, okay so this is the last slide with 31 uh, varieties uh, in different countries and more than 35,000 tons of produce and uh, near to release is 73 lines near to release. So that is the thing. Can you go next slide? And uh, this is the, the GSR-12, which is an aromatic variety. And I would like to say if an additional ton of uh, produce, if we can add in the rain fed, certainly that can change the livelihood of millions of farmers. And I would like to thank all the uh, colleagues, uh, especially Aero Nisela is our head of the division. And uh, he's uh, very encouraging for us to, to work on this area and then Zikang is the director of this project. Jun Yao is the program officer from the BMDF which has given the about 15 million dollars for this uh, phase two and uh, the phase one they gave 18 million dollars and now we are again going to the third phase and we have different coordinators uh, from different countries, 16, 16 countries in total but 13 countries I am in charge, uh, eight, eight countries in Africa, uh, eight countries in Asia, five countries in Africa and we have our AV team, uh, Alexis, Rosemary, Marco, Noli, Glenn, Choi, Pedonia, Walpede, Andy, Tauli, Krishna, many are there. And my whole team is here, uh, Justin, Neil, Bart, Corinne, Lolit, Pauline is our uh, senior administrative coordinator for seed tracking and my secretary battle. And my students, Omer, Zilas, and Saeed and Nina are from UPLP. The others are from different countries, and Varun is from India. So I have a very good uh, uh, group of people from different countries. We are training them as the future breeders for those countries, so that when they go back to their country, they will be our ambassadors to take this knowledge 
and try to do their own bidding. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to give first uh, our certificate of appreciation, and uh, here's our uh, from science director, Dr. Chito Protasho. Then we have some token for you. Right, very good seminar. Thank and, you. Uh, it's our pleasure, and we have uh, actually a lot of invited uh, uh, researchers to probably ask you something. Sure. Uh, how this happened? Yeah. Um, you have seed pockets of our vegetables okay. and one flowering uh, hibiscus and a chico. Uh, I like that tree. So that's from. Uh, so how long it will take to bear fruits? Supporters. Where we're very very. Is it a sexually propagated? The supporter. The chicken. The chicken. No, but how many years it will come to bearing? Three years. Let's have the three years. Maybe two dollars. Maybe six. Bigger, right? Okay. You're not just the time. Okay. Yeah, you still be here. Okay. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. It's nice to see how things could give a big leap, no? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Uh, anybody who would like to give a question, I need to lose yourself first. I'll give my comments or questions later. Dr. Joe Hernandez. Well, thank you for that. Uh, we discuss uh, these things during graduate uh, exams, but you gave a very uh, what's it called, comprehensive uh, uh, discussion on the background of the young material. But uh, my question is, how much, what's your investment on the base or your source population or the base population in terms of uh, resources? I, you suggested that, or you mentioned that this was started in 2009, right? Or earlier. Second one was 2010. Oh, 2010. Like so what do you think is uh, the Initial investment. You see, you see, I could understand what your question is. Generally, the breeders work with numbers. Remember that the big game of the breeders is by numbers, numbers game. They say, but this is no numbers game. Number one is we crossed only 16 crosses, right? I didn't make hundreds of crosses to do that. Only took 16 crosses. But I would suggest that the breeding skill has a big role. That is very important. You have to understand. It's not just everybody who could do that. Breeding skill plays a lot of role. The second thing is uh, the the kind of choice of the parents is very important. We caught this parent. Why we how we understood that the wheat tolerance should be a recipient parent is very important. You have to understand why we should choose a recipient parent because it was already doing very well in Bangladesh. I knew that information, and it was standing apart by one ton more in their condition, which is incredible because Giridan 28 is very difficult uh, uh, variety to be beaten. And it, uh, with, based on the data, we when I came in two years, we had that data with us in Bangladesh data. So I said, I will choose that. But my colleagues, uh, including uh, many of our colleagues in the team, said, why you want to choose uh, such a high amylose variety? It's a high amylose. We told them it's a very high amylose. And why you want to choose uh, more than 25? So why you want to choose such a variety and end up in all high amylose? I said, if I can deliver 10 varieties out of this to Bangladesh, I've done my job for this cross. That's enough. But what I found was I could go below the that 25 mark and reach up to 60 in the amylose. So, so I can now again span it up to anyone who also wants it. So that's one aspect. And you can see the number of selection screens are very limited. You're not, you can do for any trait, I told you, any trait, any trait. And the, the more you do, the more the cost will come, right? So if you can have the minimum four or five selection seeds, you can still achieve that very comfortable. That's that's possible. And you will see that many people who have done with even few crosses have also succeeded. It's not that the numbers is a game. But the numbers is the game is when you kill them. The killing machine is more important. You create a big number and kill it to reduce it to number. That is the number game. Not uh, in the sense of the screening process. The, the number game we play is in the screening process, where we do 2,000, 3,000 uh, single seats and we get up only one or two. I, I'm also wondering where, where did the things last? Where did, where oh, did yeah. the, the genes came from? Because you mentioned that uh, 
for example, in Dreistung group virus yeah. resistance, it was not present in the, in the parents. Okay. No. And the uh, submergence, there's no submergence tolerance in the parents. No, so certainly what happens is actually... Yo, what's the mechanism for... Actually, we, we fail to understand many things like that. Actually, it's, it's happening every time and now and then. And many readers experience this. It's not me alone that I'm getting these results. But nobody dares to share it. We are daring to share it. That's the only difference. People will keep silent. Why? What the heck? I will tell and make a funny face of myself. Well, no, both the parents and you get a trade. Are you kidding? That, that would be the sense. And you will be mocked at. But we are brave enough to say that this is what we got. And we did got in many, many classes like that. It's not just that one or two classes we are talking. We did in the past also we got that result. But what happens is the reason is called as the epi, epistatic complementation. You have half a gene, gene in this side and the other set is on the other parent. Both are non-functional. But when they come into a play, they complement each other in such a way and the whole product is done. So sometimes this is called at intergenic complementation or intragenic complement. Even within a gene, complementation can take place. You might have studied in genetics 101 course, right? Intragenic and intragenetic genetic uh, complementation. So these kind of things happen. One of the very glaring uh, thing happened was very recently, XA39 was discovered that way. You see our new paper, which was published very last, and we went, dug into deeply into that. It was discovered from the Hong Kong Zan interrogation line. Both the parents did not have the gene at all. But it gave a broad spectrum resistance for more than 14 races of BLB. Or how on the earth it is. This is uh, susceptible to 10 races. This is susceptible to the other parent is susceptible to 5, 6, 6 races. Both the parents are susceptible. And you end up in a line which is tolerant to 14 races. Come on. So this kind of thing happened. And how it happened and how it could explain was the intragenic complementation. It took place in a very particular region where the broad spectrum resistance gene was there. And this allowed us to. Uh, see that new gene evolving. You get no point. So this is uh, very interesting, and now we have gone to transcriptomics and other details to dig on, deeper into that. You have to follow those papers for more details. Anybody? So I am just discussing from ITB. So I used to work with fibrils. Actually, I I visited some of your site in uh, Victoria. I was one of the participants. And also your setup here in here, and some of your metrias in Malaysia and here in here. So actually, it, the 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 varieties are impressive. Actually, I tried to use them in some of my breeding activities before. And also, I would just like to ask the if, if you are still maintaining your population that you compose uh, during the first phase. Or you just after you just discard them, discard them or you, you actually the, the method is recurrent selection, which is I'm very used to. No, it. actually, yeah, I got your point. What you are, you want to ask? Uh, this question is: Do we after all these integration lines we develop and we what do we keep it or we throw it away or what? So actually, when we get a very good integration line uh, at the third level of screening, we are reaching something like two thousand plus of interrogation lines which survived these conditions, number one, excelled over their donor and recipient parent, and also it was on par or better than the check. So this traits, all the 2000 are very good, but which of the best 35 only I nominate? Can you believe it? Out of 2000, I only nominate 35. That is why they do the best there. It's not just, uh, I just randomly pick anything and give you 35. It's the elite of the elite. If you have to compete with that 35, I, I believe it should be the toughest for anyone to compete in that category. Because you are crushing that number from 2000 to 35. You can imagine all what, and I, the data is from many, many locations from my trials. I have my own internal site, is five sites I have doing trials every season. Five sites, it's run, replicated in trials. Cold. Drought, salinity, submergence, uh, uh, yield, unirrigated. So this is done by myself every season, with the whole lot. So you can imagine now how powerful it is. And that information I have with me, I, how I will crunch the numbers. That 2000, I can make it to 35. But these remaining ones are also good. It's not that they are not good. 
what you will do with that? How many can you release? That's the question now. You cannot release all the truth, many numbers. Even 100 if I want to release, I can't. I don't want to do that. So we just look at the best ones and let the, let the people understand and let them do it on their own. Yeah, we, are, we are trying to teach a concept here. We are not trying to do breeding for everyone. We are not doing that kind of thing. We are trying to develop these products and teach the others that this is how we do it. Now you do it yourself, you learn it, that's it. So but, you, yeah. So, I would touch. Uh, so you have this established composite, composite population beforehand with uh, 17 donor parents. Okay, that donor parents are 56 of the elite yeah. core collection. Yeah. This is uh, from the, the most diverse set from the 500 donor pool. We have four or 500 donor pool, which is sequenced. Yeah. From that 500 pool is this 16. Okay, yeah. They emerge from there. So they are all sequenced. Whenever we want to know any genetics of that, we can go to those sequences and get it done. But I, I tell you, personally asking me, you don't need them. You ask me a personal question. Do you need that genomics data and all those things? I don't need it. When you can look at a submergent trial, it's surviving, you know that submergent tolerant. When it is in drought, it's surviving, you know that it's having drought tolerant genes. If it is surviving in salinity, you know that it's salt tolerant. You don't need a gene to understand that is salt tolerant. Yeah. It is the survival of the survival is the, the game. So why you need all that information is to get a good publication. That's like why we they made it. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no more question. Uh, yeah. It's only the study. Anyone? Yeah, but mm -hmm. it's a very common thing. Anyone yeah. can do it. Anyone else would, would have a question? We can we can have a chat with him a little bit. Who has another question? Anything? I'd like to give my question. Sure. I uh, enjoyed um, studying stress physiology in, as far as I can remember, in, in um, uh, there's lots of parallels, so I understand your results. Because if you look at um, co um, chilling, cold, and look at drought, and look at um, even sometimes heat, there's a lot of things that, yeah. that are just happening the yeah. same. But what's the What's the area where you have the highest temperature? They're doing trials now. And what are the kind of results that you get from those GSR trials? Because to me, uh, the warming, you know, global warming and yeah. very warm temperatures is an issue. So you get good results from okay. those very hot Yeah, what areas. you will see, yeah, uh, in the case of uh, uh, heat and uh, drought, I always take it together. I don't treat them separately. Uh, for me, heat and drought is the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Yeah, when you have drought, that. you have the heat side by side. Mm -hmm. And when we have our drought experiments, when we reach that 500 kilopascals minus, mm -hmm. we are actually having a real scorching effect there. Even in the dry season, we have that kind of effect. And whenever we nominate, we used to nominate our drought material into the heat category in the India, and they did very well, even blindly. We never ever screened for heat tolerance, but these metals were uh, placed in different countries, in different in the heat tolerance nursery, and they did very well. The results so are there. What's the hottest temperature? The highest temperatures uh, it can touch up to uh, 45 degrees, uh, exceeding the 40 is the like threshold. How many, how many 40 is the degrees? threshold. Remember that. Uh -huh. Beyond 40 is sterile. Even 38, you will say the sterility begins. So 40 is the threshold, but there are places in the world where. 45 degrees rice can be cultivated. And one place is in uh, Iran, I, I remember that. And the other place is in Pakistan. Uh, also we have a site uh, there. And these sites are all targeted in this uh, heat tolerance nursery through the India. We don't do our own nursery because we are not caring about that. We know the drought has a very good correlation with heat. Any more questions? So your approach for breeding for multiple stress tolerance has this been tried in other crops since? After we started, the uh, people started copying, yes. uh, like in uh, barley, wheat, mm -hmm. soybean, but mostly in China. But uh, not again uh, for multiple stress. For the backcross uh, approach has been adopted, not the way we are doing. The one we are doing at Erie is very unique. Even in China, they don't do it. Because they don't have submergence there. <laughs> so they cannot do for submergence, number one. 
the salinity is very far from Beijing, right? Okay. So they can't do for salinity. So that way, many things they can't do multi-stress. But we have an opportunity in the Philippines because Infanta Quezon is very close, close by where we do the natural site screening. Previously, we are doing in these uh, boxes and all those things, uh, hydroponics and all those things, but that didn't work. So we go directly to the sea coast for yeah, and cold for Luquan. Another, another part of I heard Bill Gates uh, visited your field. Did he give you a tip? No. <laughs> he visited very closely to my field. <laughs> uh, and we are already getting good support from the Gates Foundation. And uh, we are getting about 5.3 in the phase two uh, million. And then uh, in the phase three, we'll again get a good amount, I hope. So uh, they are very impressed by the uh, products and the output that this project is delivering. And uh, the, the good science is that uh, we have the genomics tools now backed up with that. So that makes it very exciting in the future that people will enjoy uh, the genomics tool. And even the interrogation lines that we will be breeding, uh, will be deriving, most of them will be also sequenced. So the, the sequence technology will become very cheap. So everybody can do sequencing and everybody will be carrying uh, your own uh, chip for your, your own DNA code, I think, in very shortly, maybe $100 a kit. So it should be possible in the near future. So it should not be a big thing for anyone. It's very common thing. another group of the uh, uh, which is doing cropping systems research after rice followed by maize or something yeah. so their uh, their foliage uh, they will put it dry cut it and all sorts of uh, crop cropping systems that's what i know <laughs> without seeing asking that question to them <laughs> but that is the very uh, basic thing they are they're doing cropping systems research I think we'll see more of what uh, Eli has to offer in the coming years because they're building a new climate uh, yeah. climate smart facility that's huge, yeah. you know. Um, and then, yeah, things would be very much different. But I, I would suggest that uh, the natural sites like you have in the Philippines is amazing. Actually, you have the, all the good sites where naturally you can screen them. And that is more powerful than any, uh, any control condition. Though you, for publication point of view, control conditions can be good to answer some questions. But natural sites are the ones which will take the material to the farmer's field. Right? You do anything in your field, in the uh, screen house or in the in your pot, potted experiments, they will have good results, but they will not reach the farmers. Um, if you have to reach the farmers, do they, how they do it. <laughs> I brought my class to me. Uh, yeah, Georgina gave a talk about next gen rice. Yeah. Now I am um, reminded uh, she identified like that there are twelve ecosystems now classified. Agroecology. Yeah, yeah, for for the Philippines. Yeah. But I counted yours. It's just like ten. So how do we? What do you uh, remember? What's the other? No, I, I am very weak in that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what uh, the agroecologies are there is uh, basically. Uh, I told you that the basic factors are the water. If you can address water and flooding, the water flooding and drought are the two key traits. And if you can have these two traits, you know, all your wetting, I don't see any big challenge. And the deeping, uh, deep root systems can take care of the uplands. Uh, um, I noticed your um, uh, super rice plants that are growing very well are quite compact. Yeah. So I'm wondering about the biomass partitioning. Yeah, they have. Is, has it changed significantly compared to the original parentals? Of course, of course. Because they're yeah. quite Very, strong. very strong and sturdy. Yeah. Yeah. So this uh, biomass partitioning, we have one paper published in uh, FCR. You can refer to that. That mm -hmm. we have seen these components, how they, how they, uh, how they help the plant to overcome drought mm -hmm. and how they work. 
cover the water use efficiency. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The water use efficiency increases. Yeah. The partitioning has a very big role, how it plays. So they, they keep their uh, uh, reserves in such a way that when the water is there, they just go quickly to that step. And when there is not there, there, there is a remain farm. So it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon that we observe. And uh, the tolerant ones from the uh, susceptible ones to drop. So uh, the new, that is the first generation material. But the new generation, second generation or third generation materials are much superior in drought tolerance uh, and other traits. Uh, those will be different, I think, again. I'm wondering about the flood, like flood tolerance, because I, I saw many of six and uh, plants. The wild type, tall, lumpy, yeah. so the greenhouse is just across my yeah. I mean, I'm studying PhD. So have you studied more of that type, those that would be more like, <coughs> supervised? taller for those that would be submerged at the high Okay, there are different types of flooding. We call it a stagnant stagnant flooding and uh, deep water rises. We are not talking about deep water rises. Only one or two cultivars in the world are there which falls in that category, which one is Jal Magna, uh, a variety called Jal Magna. It can go very high, up to 10 feet top, mm -hmm. and uh, it grows along with the, uh, the water rise. And when it reaches on the top, it flowers and produces. You need a boat to go there to <laughs> harvest it. Uh, the stagnant one is uh, one which you often find uh, stagnant flooding in uh, many parts of India. You have this problem. It's not submergence. Submergence is 14 days and it goes away. The water because recedes and everything is normal. A flood will take over for 14 days and that's submergence. But stagnant will be the water uh, builds up with the season. With the season it builds up. So it will keep on rising slowly, 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 slowly. But the water will always be there. It will not go away from there. So that is a different scenario. That means it's not flooding for, it's flooding for the whole crop cycle itself. And it will never dry even at the harvest time. You have to harvest again by uh, swimming around and then <laughs> cut the crops. Otherwise you have to have in our field, they drain it and then they harvest it. But uh, that's the big challenge, the stagnant flooding. Uh, and the genes are different from the submergent problems. They are not the same. Yep. Uh, just a comment. I remember reading um, like a recommendation way back. I think even, if, I'm not sure if it's during Marcus's time, but they were looking at like the Agusa and marshland and down in the south of Mindanao was like potential you know, expansion. So, although many were against it because it's a fragile ecosystem, but, but those are examples of areas, and now I'm recalling our visit to the Tandaba swamps in Pampanga, and that's another like, example that gets flooded. So I think it also makes sense to do. You no, know, actually, there's a lo lot of these areas. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you flooded. that there are plenty of places with this type of uh, swampy areas, and uh, we don't want to uh, do everything rice. Don't think that way. Do something else. <laughs> that's the simplest solution. But the other thing is that uh, in places like some, some, one of my students is working on lahar soils. Can GSR work for the lahar soils? The extreme drought ones, we picked the most extreme drought that we had in our collection and we put there and they're doing very well. In lahar soil, the water retention is, the morning you put, evening is dry. It's like that kind of soil. It cannot, doesn't hold. And we are, uh, uh, alternate irrigation we are doing at five days interval, I think. Five days to keep that, uh, but the crop is so good now. <laughs> so I think we could have reduced till gone to eight level, eight days or ten days. But this depends on what kind of uh, scenarios are there. And this area is very limited again. Lahar soils are worldwide, how much would be, I don't I don't think it would be more than 50,000 hectares. Overall, in the Pampanga area, I think it is, 5,000 hectares, something. That's what I understood. Is it Pampanga or what? Pampanga. Yeah. The guy is from Pampanga Agriculture College. But he's still inside. Yeah, he's from that Pampanga Agriculture College. MS student. So it is doing very well. So he was very excited. So are you recommending more of the informal type of seed? No, actually, no. No, no, there is two ways of looking at it. You want to reach the farmer, at the end what do you want to do? What is your objective as a breeder in your lifetime? If you are a good breeder,